have five luxury screens, we have fine dining, we have a rooftop restaurant, a poolside restaurant, a hotel, and all of that's in there. So Ebony Life really, for us, you know, our key vision is to change the narrative. And you can only do that by creating um, anchors and projects um, and activations that tell that story. So for us, it's telling the story with film, with television, and with real life experiences like you will find at Ebony Life Place. Absolutely, so that's, that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. It's kind of like the, the entertainment ecosystem you're plugging in at, at different at various levels. levels, absolutely. I should probably ask you this just before we go into you know, the, the core, the, the, the nuggets in, in, uh, that this um, panel is supposed to be about, but you talk about changing the narrative. And this is something that's become quite fashionable. Yeah, very. In, in Africa, you're always hearing about people changing the narrative. What's what you're doing bringing to the table in terms of achieving that goal? Well, for me, this changing the narrative actually started in 2006 um, when I decided that I wanted to launch Moments with Mo. Um, and the essence, I mean, I remember going into multi-choice at the time and having a conversation with, you know, um, the managing director at the time, and I said, I want to do this talk show. Now, I had no experience in television at the time or media. I'm totally self-taught. And um, the very first thing they said to me was, but, you know, we have the Oprah Winfrey show, we have the Ellen DeGeneres show, and at the time they had the Tyra Banks show. And I said, great, I love all of these shows, um, and I watch them. But really and truly, how does that tell my story? Um, how does that showcase my continent? I watch them for purely entertainment. But therefore, for us, launching, a, launching Moments with Mo at the time was a show that was focusing on telling our stories. Something as simple as, I want to lose weight. And I kept using the example of, if I'm watching um, an Oprah Winfrey show, she's probably going to tell me that, you know, go on a diet and eat Archichokes or whatever it is, or asparagus, which I can't find in Lagos, Nigeria. So if I want to lose weight in Lagos today, what are the things that I need to do to be able to do that? What is the ecosystem that's supporting you to help you lose weight in this country? Again, we have episodes, I mean, Oprah's done a million episodes on domestic violence, but am I going to call 111 or 999 in New York to come and help me if my husband's beating me to death? I don't think so. I need to know someone locally that I can reach out to that can help me deal with my pain. Um, if I want to adopt a child, I need to find someone locally that is dealing with that. So for me, um, it was about changing the narrative and being able to tell our stories locally. Um, again, it was about showcasing the best of the continent in terms of, I mean, a lot of the music stars that we know today that are, you know, have, as they say, they have blown. Um, a lot of them started off by coming on Moments with Mo in those days. We didn't have Instagram or anything then, but somehow, you know, it's really, I mean, I love looking back and seeing a lot of them now that are totally like, you know, have all these millions of followers who 10 years ago, literally, you know, they were just starting out. So even our music industry is not that old. No. It's not. So for me, changing the narrative started with the talk show. And then I, I got so, so... Um, inspired and passionate about that, that I said there had to be more than a talk show. And then I developed a couple of other TV shows. One was The Debaters, the other was Niger Diamonds. And then after that, it was like, you know what, we need to do more. Then came the idea to start the network, and then the films, and then everything else has followed. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask you uh, the, the same question. Is, is any of this for you, the journey that you've been on, is any of it about changing the narrative? Yes, of course. Yet, yeah, of course. I, I'm going to say the story from the beginning, right? I started my first career with an IT training center in Kano. I'm from Kano, northern Nigeria. I was born and brought up in Kano, so you can imagine how I was brought up. So I, uh, by 2000, it started in 2003. By 2005, We've trained a lot of IT professionals, and we realized that we are not changing their lives. So we train them in MCSE, Oracle, Comtia, Linux, and still they come out of our center without jobs. So I started researching on what I could do to create employment for those people and in Nigeria. I looked at BPO because at the time, my center was an NIT franchise, uh, franchise. 
So I looked at India and I, I saw BPO and I started researching, okay, what did they do? What are the parameters? So when I looked at everything that is required to actually service the US market and the UK, and I saw that we have everything and even better. So then I went ahead and I said, okay, so if I have to compete with India, I have to be better than India. So what do I need to do that? So I, I did a lot of research in terms of the technology, the switching arrangement, the, the, the processes that were putting in place. Well, of course, you know the story. It took me eight years to start Outsource. I started it four times because I insisted that we have to do it better than India. And for me to do that, I have to put the right infrastructure, I have to put the right processes, I have to put the right people. And um, yes, it took me eight years. I started it four times and failed. I went live June 2016. And uh, even after going live with a domestic client, I couldn't uh, find an American client. So I packed my bag one day. I went to America and I started telling people how we set up the center according to international standard, how we have best of that, best of this. And one of them got up in one of the programs that I attended and said, why don't you come with me to San Francisco? I can arrange a lot of meetings for you and it's up to you to sell. So I met about 15 people, all of them telling me the same thing. Nigeria is not a well-known outsourcing destination. You are inexperienced. Nigeria is not experienced in BPO. Why should we move our operations to you? All of them literally were saying the same thing. Until I met the 15, I got connected to the 15th person. And I felt at that point that I cannot go back to Nigeria without a client. So I told him, give me five customer service seats. I will take care of connectivity, everything. I will give you three months free of charge. If you don't like it, you walk away. So I gave him an offer he couldn't receive. And he said, fine, OK, I have nothing to lose. So I came back to Nigeria. I found people with American accents. <laughs> we have, we have <laughs> so and we went live, yes, uh, that, uh, September, uh, that June 2016. And today that client has 300 people with me. Wow. So, and from that client, we, he recommended other clients and we kept on moving. And today we are 850 employees. So we went from telemarketing, customer service, to legal services, to accounting services, to IT support services, to medical records. We are now three centers in three years and serving three different locations, US, UK, and Japan. So basically, we have made Nigeria an outsourcing destination. So Nigeria is on the map when I went live, you know, as an outsourcing. All our, our agents are proving that a lot of, uh, all the companies that we, ha we are serving are actually moving operations from India and Philippines to us. One, they like the accent. They like the IT support services, and we're doing it cheaper. So, uh, you know, so we have changed the narrative. The whole point was to create employment, and then I went into so much more, more than that. Yeah, thank you. That's pretty phenomenal. And, and what's interesting um, for me, one of the things that's really interesting, and one of the reasons why I really wanted you to come here is that even in the South, people often have a certain they, conception, they, they have this idea, this notion in their head or in their heads of what um, a northern Nigerian woman is like. And I really wanted them to meet you because, um, okay, let me, I'm going to ask you both a question now. And, um, right, what quality do you think you have um, that might have made this journey possible or easier for you? I actually want to know, do you think that being a woman has um, meant that there's certain things you're able to do? 
that perhaps if it was a man who was in your place, the man wouldn't have been able to achieve what you've achieved? I, I really want to know your opinion. Has being a woman been an advantage? It is. It, I, I'm going to let you answer this question first. <laughs> so, so, um, so. Well, speaking from experience, and I'll speak from a point of view of how I have run Ebony Life. Um, and, and, and I think sometimes, you know, and I say this to a lot of young people, you know, I turned 55 this year. Um, I have a 30-year-old daughter and a 23-year-old son. I continue to learn a lot from them, from their generation, but I've also learned from my mom and from my generation. So therefore, one of the major things I decided, and in, this is in all the companies that I have set up, is that a lot of our workforce is mainly women. Because unfortunately, and I have to say this to our men, and I say this to my son, and he is taking it seriously, we have too many men in our society that are very idealistic about things. They dream a lot about things. And it's good to dream, but really it's about taking that dream and doing. And I often find that our women are doers. You know, our women multitask. Our women are more passionate about the things that they do, and they put their heart and soul into it. And that's one key lesson I have learned, even with setting up Ebony Life. And even prior to that, Vic Lawrence and Associates, which is also an outsourcing business, but not focusing on the areas that you focus on. Again, I have a woman that, that, that runs that today. But looking at Ebony Life, um, our head of um, legal, head of human resources, head of strategy, head of programming, they're all female. Now, yes, I did make a conscious effort to employ more women because we are underrepresented, but nonetheless, I also took that decision because I know that when it's time to do, in my experience, I have found that women tend to be doers. Do you think that has something to do with um, the way our men are brought up or the way our boys are raised? Because if you go to the, 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 the simplest place to go with this, this conversation is um, uh, something that happens on Twitter a lot when they're talking about should women cook for their husbands, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and some people will tell you that, you know, as a son, I, I never entered the kitchen my mother cooked, my sisters cook, therefore I refuse to marry a woman who can't cook, as if that's the job she came to do in life. But um, <laughs> we know your opinion. <laughs> you know, no, but, but, but the I, point I I'm you, making is, no, is it something, I mean, what's going on in our society I, I, if I, our I, men? Yes, but I think our women and our mothers and aunts and uncles and sisters do have a responsibility to make sure that our men respect our women. But that's not to say, I mean, I'm divorced, but I was married. And the thing is that women are able to multitask. Because even as a married woman, I would work. I would look after my children. I would still find time to go home and cook. Or sometimes I would do it remotely by having the support system to ensure that I can do it. Society has thrust upon women these responsibilities. And we are still able to do them. But you are a man. Eh? And you are not given these responsibilities, and you are spending all day dreaming. I have a problem with that. So, please, for, for the men, you know, do a bit more. Please support us, but also do a little bit more than dreaming. But we women, I've noticed that we do do a lot more, you know, and... You know where this is all going, don't you? Because where? we have told people that... No, no, I'm not even joking about this. In the next 20, 30 years, this entire continent is going to be run by, by women. women. It's, go, it's looking just, like that. It's, 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 there's nothing I'm more certain yeah, of. Yeah. Because when you look around and you look at businesses, you see, they wouldn't let us do governance. Mm. Because if it, we had a female governor... I have a feeling that things would be run differently, but I still want you to answer this question as well. Okay, so let me start by answering the way she answered, because you always take lead from the master, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm also married. I'm, uh, I have four kids. Okay. So I, I married at a very young age, like any northerner, um, at the age of 19. Um, so I had my first child in university, 
my first year in university. She's actually, okay, I, I can't say her age because you will guess how old I am now. So, <laughs> we want to so, know. So she's in, her, she's in her final year. I always tell people one of the qualities that I think we women have in Nigeria is perseverance. Mm. And one of the qualities that I know I'm not that intelligent or <laughs> I'm not different from any other person in Nigeria is just that I'm able to persevere. Mm. I have seen a dream and I'm trying to actualize that dream. And I would not stop until it is no. actually done. So what I did is I rely 100% on God and I put all my energy towards achieving that dream knowing that he is the only person that can make it happen, right? So one of the things that's, that I know we have, and I've seen it in our, la uh, our employees, is that perseverance. Because when it comes to business, you have to be able to persevere. So when you look at all the failed companies in Nigeria, because I think, I, I don't want to be, I think men do not have that kind of perseverance. Right? So you have to be able to persevere. So what we've done in outsource is, is of course, we did the same way as Mo did in her company. We actually focus on, yes, bringing in the women, and we, have, we put a different structure of actually bringing people in and actually promoting them. So the normal traditional structure is the person that can speak more and the person that looks like he's going to do the work more gets paid or get put in a certain rule. So what we've done is we created four core values, honesty and integrity, uh, insisting on higher standard, constantly improving, and, uh, sorry, did I, I missed one, right? Honesty and integrity, integrity, insisting on higher standard, making an impact and constantly improving. So those, these four core values are what we use to bring people in. For you to actually work with us, you have to have that. So from the interview, you find out that based on these four core values, we bring more women in. And then when it's time for promotion, how you demonstrate these four core values is how you, we promote you. So one day I just woke up, outsource is 50% women, and most of the management roles are 